Thanks for tuning in to part three of our topic on mental health in our Scripture over Social Media series. We've really investigated the topic through our panelists' journeys as, as well and discussed strategies for managing and taking care of their mental health. And in this final part of our talk, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to consider what personal cross we as Christians perhaps are asked by God to bear in the topic of mental health. Uh, what does mental health look like as a Christian in the day-to-day -day life? And how much resolution can we possibly hope for? What biblical examples uh, can we look at, as well as mentors or confidence uh, that could potentially exist in our lives? Uh, all of that is encouraging and helpful for us, and we ask God's blessings on our study. I do remember a, a young woman uh, when I was preaching once, I was talking about mental health and leveraging it for an opportunity to grow in faith. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a young woman who very clearly had a, a history of like struggling with mental health stuff, fire a really like angry email out to me. Uh, she was not a member of our church. She was visiting and she, but she said that it was really dangerous uh, talking for me to, she said, mental health is a chemical issue. It's an internal, you know, brain chemistry thing. Mm -hmm. And therefore to accuse somebody of a lack of faith, um, in their struggle was damaging and hurtful and, you know, churches shouldn't do that. And I, I, and she didn't really know me. And I, I went back and said, yep, I, I don't disagree with that stuff that you're saying. I think I said, I think you need to see it as like, there's a part in this that's my cross to bear. And if I embrace it more deeply, I'll become more Christ-like and grow in faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think one of the things I wanted to ask you, is there anything that about your mental health struggle that you thought like, this is without question made me more Christ-like or brought me into deeper relationship with God? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And um, I feel really... Um like a, a huge blessing that I've gotten, been able to go up and down um, with my mental health history that I, and have had the opportunities to speak with people and to really reflect on it. There are lots of people who suffer with this and just live mm -hmm. lives that just despair. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I just feel really, really um, blessed that I've been able to have good enough relationships with other Christians that I can reflect on this. Yeah. Um, and absolutely. And really, um, one of the biggest conclusions I've come to is that I just, I didn't know what it meant to receive mercy. Yeah. Um, and um, I really believe that God, you know, wanted me to go through this. I mean, sometimes when you are, you know, going through life and you're killing it, you yeah. know what I mean? And everybody thinks you're great. Yeah. You don't give mercy to other people who don't know how to be compassionate. Yeah. Um, and so he literally had to like shove me in bed and be like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to need to, you're going to learn what it means to rely on other people. You're going to learn what it means to not be able to rely on your own brain. Cause that, that's a, it's a big point of pride with, for me. I yeah. Mean, I, I am a high academic achiever. Mm -hmm. That's something that has been just a thing for me my entire life. Mm -hmm. I rely on logic. Yeah. I'm a scientist. <laughs> And for me to say my brain isn't everything. Yeah. Like yeah. That's that's that was really transformative to me. And so um the the writing that I've done, we talked a little bit about like journaling mm -hmm. and like being reflective. I mean, that's the folder of my computer my computer. It is labeled mental illness and mercy mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that is completely for for me, I understood, I, I began to understand in the last several years that what I need to learn is what it means to receive mercy, even yeah. though in the Bible you learn about how you receive mercy from God, but it's not until you understand just how badly you need it yeah, that you can even begin to turn around and give it to somebody else. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's why we're here, you know, yeah. like, why did he leave us here? Yeah. <laughs> and I, and that's a big theme no. for me too. Why did you leave me here? <laughs> that's, that's great. The idea that there's one thing you can memorize a passage about grace but it's an entirely different thing to experience grace from God uh, from a transformative experience mm -hmm. of grace to, to then be able to be motivated to show it to other people. 
Mm-hmm. Because just memorizing a passage about it might, if that's all you do with the concept of grace, that might just make yourself righteous because you know more one more Bible passage than other people. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, having to need the grace, mm-hmm. uh, yep, that's now you're humbled by it and, and empowered mm-hmm. by it. I'm yeah. sorry to be all like grace or just mercy with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but mercy being the, you know, forbearance of, you know, like judgment, like I failed and was worthless many, many times in my life. Mm-hmm. And that I received mercy from other people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like mm-hmm. truly like knowing that I have I have not met the bar, that I have missed the bar. So yeah. that that idea that really yeah. truly like I do deserve for people to be like fired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or you are not pulling your weight in this family. Sure. Like and sure. how many times they haven't. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, and that's so yeah. That. No, that's great. Yeah. Um, I'm also curious if there are any specific, I mentioned Elijah earlier as mm-hmm. one that to me was like, wow, I can't believe this is just a more sophisticated understanding of uh, addressing depression, like a holistic way to approach depression than what I've heard from mental health professionals or pastors or whatever before. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, other people can have a simplistic take, but the Bible doesn't have a simplistic take. Mm-hmm. I'm curious if there's any stories in the Bible or passages in the Bible that you just thought have been so like helpful for you in understanding yourself and your struggles with mental health along the way that you've been able to sort of lean on. Are there any particulars that come to mind for you? <laughs> How much time do we have? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I love the story of Naomi. Um, and I I think one of my biggest fears would be like losing losing my husband losing yeah. you know losing ch- my children um and for her to lose her her sons and her husband and to the point where she she you when you think about names being changed yeah, in the bible yep. like this is because she's full of so much despair like yeah. she's she said she's like don't call me Naomi anymore <laughs> like uh, like call me call me despair, you know, and call me Mara. And, but what I love about it is, is Ruth and how the the story for me, it, it always teaches me two things. Number one, like Ruth is, is such a great friend, well, great daughter-in-law and she's so faithful and like, we need Ruth's in our lives uh, when we are not able to get out of bed. (laughs) um, And when we are saying, don't 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 call me like don't call me up like I, I don't even want to hang out yeah um I don't want to hear it I don't want to hear about God I don't want you to invite me to church or whatever it is yeah yeah but also in the end that you know Ruth is the ultimate or Jesus is the ultimate Ruth yeah you know and yep. and what Ruth does for Naomi Jesus does for us and I don't I how can you not think about Jonah too yeah. Like it's such yeah. a depressing like ending too. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he still extends the mercy even though he's angry and that resonates with me just like from someone who has been angry and mm. um yeah. <laughs> like yeah. just like waving my fists at God and I mean not even God I'm mad at you but sometimes I'll say like like why did you give me so much anger God? Um, but the, the whole point, I love what you said about your, like, you really, your logic is like what you rely on. And I feel like for me that it's the opposite. Like I've always relied on my emotions to get me through life. Mm -hmm. And like, even though I've had low emotions, I just cling to and thrive on joy and, Mm -hmm. and trying to be happy and so for me, the best way to really hold on to God's promises is looking at the Bible because yeah. I, when, when all I think about are my feelings, I have no logic. And so I've had to train myself, like, how yeah. do I become biblically literate? Like, I have to look at, I yeah. have to start looking at the stories in the Bible and seeing, seeing what, yeah, how, how God has extended his hand to them. Yeah. yeah. I think even though we have two like kind of different approaches, and I knew that about us, we were yeah. kind of like we <laughs> see like kind of from different, different angles. Um, but really, like the the answer is the same because when I look in the Bible and I can think to myself, well, I've read this lots of times. 
oh my gosh, every time I open, like, I really like, I'm drawn to something. Like, so if, if there's a sermon text or a Bible study text and I really open it up and I look at it and I'm like, did I ever even read that before? Have, yeah. I, have I read that once before in my life? Yeah. Probably, probably, but like, wait a minute, like how come I have never seen this before? And yeah, yeah. so I think like, um, I, <laughs> Jonah is so funny. Oh my God. <laughs> so like, but I'm glad it's funny you brought that up because like, I feel that way about like that God had to take, like swallow me up and like spit me out where I didn't want to be. Like, yeah. Running away from him. <laughs> yeah. Totally be no, like, I see what you're doing, I'm, God, I'm running away from yeah, him. Yeah, <laughs> and he literally had to like, like make me not be able to like take care of myself. Mm. And, then, and then I had to go home. And then, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Where I was trying to leave anyway. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I feel often that I've been thrown up uh, to where I was supposed to be going. Um, so Jonah's great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the other thing too is, so I, I have lots of things that you can see all these bookmarks. And <laughs> I wasn't yeah. trying to look like I was supposed to be like superior. I just had too many ideas. Um, but yeah, but really like, I, like I open this up and I'm just like, I've never read this before. I maybe I have, um, but just going through the Psalms. I mean, I know that that's mm-hmm. kind of cliche, but I mean, really like what David describes, oh, yeah. that's not yeah. like, oh, I feel bad today. Yeah, mm-hmm. That's like, I am near death because of how sad I am. Yeah. And so, yeah. So what I would, uh, one of the, one of the sections that I like to share with people is Psalm 40, mm-hmm. um, where he says, I wait patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. So just like that first verse um, reminds me about waiting patiently for the Lord and that he will deliver. And that even the man, you know, who knew God so well, you know, like that was his like time on earth experience. I mean, then he goes on to describe about being in a slimy pit and being yeah. in mud and mire. Like these are not like, yeah, like th- this is like, ooh, like yeah. I feel about as horrible as possible kind of descriptions. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, I just, I, I could go through this whole psalm. I won't, I won't like preach a sermon, but just in verse three, he talks about, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. And so I just really, like to be able to share that, that the experience of having mental health issues is for me has been the process of taking out the song. I thought I was supposed to sing the song I had written for my life yeah. and to have something entirely new from God mm-hmm. be placed into my mouth as in, I wasn't going to think of these lyrics on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Like right. these were not coming out of my heart. I'll tell you that much, you mm-hmm. know? So that, you know, to get to that point in verse three, that he put a new song in my mouth. Yeah. Um, is really, it was really, really transformative. Yeah. That is so beautiful. Yeah. The, so- the yeah. Psalms in, in general, yeah. I think, are I, like, I don't, hearing somebody in a very raw way cry out to God and, and there's, there's anger in it and there's yeah. Ho- yeah. seeming like hopelessness in it. But like when you aim all those emotions in the right direction, like when they go out to God, um, like God as a father is big enough to hear the the tantrums of a little child and like, you know, almost like, you know, a kid pounding on their dad's chest um, and they're sad and they're angry and they're whatever, but God's big enough to, uh, to take it and hold you in the process. Um, but it's, it's completely cathar- cathartic to actually express those things to him. And the Psalms are a great example of like, you're trying to learn how to pray you're trying to learn how to talk to God. The Psalms are like this untapped um, resource of stuff to do it. So, yeah. yeah. I will say, I mean, in my, in my sort of like natural tendency to withdraw, like when I'm feeling bad, um, I can see a really tangible example with David being like, no, when you're in that place, God does want to hear about it and how different that is from like, I don't know what everybody's upbringing was, but I didn't, I didn't, share stuff with my parents yeah like and that i think that culturally our church was probably a lot like that you know the respect you have for your parents when you kind of leave them alone i don't know how you just like can't see hope (laughs) in in the bible because like i mean so many people Mm -hmm. are literally saying i want to die like i wish i was never born Mm -hmm. and he's still like god delivers them yeah, just, that's really important. Yeah, and when you say like there's so much hope in the Bible and it, it is it's not shallow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These are not people yeah. that are like, 
I had a great life. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody in this book had a great life. Yeah. <laughs> I can't think of one person who had a great life in this book. Yeah, yeah. And it's a bunch of, yeah, the framing, even that of, uh, right, a bunch of people who have life together and here's how we should emulate them versus a bunch mm -hmm. of sinners saved by grace who are kind of failing forward because of God's grace. You know, there's mm -hmm. forgiveness and then that's empowering them to be, you know, more, more Christ-like on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, there's there's obviously lots of different places in the Bible we could go to. Uh, Can I do just one more? Yeah, please do. Terrible. Please do. I'm just really enthusiastic. Yeah, no, please. Well, no, just one. And this this is the one that I think I can point to as being a, a pivotal, a pivotal passage in like in me making connections between what I was experiencing with depression and my my spiritual journey. And it is Paul's thorn in the flesh from Second Corinthians 12. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I I like almost fell out of my chair when I read it. Um, I'm sure I'd read it before. And so in 12 verse 7, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7, it says to keep me from being conceited mm -hmm. because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. It says three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. And verse 9 is really was like, Ugh. he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And just the whole idea that what I was going through, God wasn't just being like, mm, too bad. Yeah. I forgive yeah. you. He was going to turn around and make it part of his power. He was going to make that useful. Not just like, that's okay. I get it. You're yeah. weak. Like, no, I'm going to use this for my for my plan, this is all part of the plan. And so when I feel like my, when I believe that my struggles allows me to be merciful to people, mm -hmm. that is his power being made perfect in my weakness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That so that was like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes total sense. Um, that's, that's great. And I appreciate you. The, the uh, Apostle Paul's thorn in the flesh is another one of those great things that to keep me from becoming conceited, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which at the heart of some level of anxiety uh, is this issue. Like, I know how my life is supposed to go mm -hmm. better than you, God. If you just hop on board with my plan for my life, everything will be fine. <laughs> The totally, reality yeah, is totally. if, if I have enough yeah. humility to say like, eh, I have some sinful inklings in my heart, some selfishness. And so it'd be much better if my heart hopped on board with your plan mm -hmm. than for you to hop on board with my plan. I, I mentioned actually, you know, what role do you think for a Christian medication plays? Maybe kind of controversial on the other end of it, but the spiritual component of it, to what role do you think something like even repentance plays in recovery of mental health mm -hmm. struggles? We, like I said, this is not to say we know there's a, a mm -hmm. chemical component. We know there's a nature component. I am certainly not saying everyone, uh, every time somebody struggles, mm -hmm. because let's say you lose a, you go through a traumatic experience, you lose a loved one. Of course, there's going to be some sadness and melancholy and whatever, and it might come become a depression. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not necessarily saying there's anything to repent over, but for your personal mm -hmm. experience, has there been anything along the way? It sounds mm -hmm. like, for instance, Anna, what you're saying is that there's a, there was a level of maybe pride or whatever else oh, sure. that yeah. God led me to repentance over. And that was mm -hmm. part of the progress for me. It was absolutely. Yeah. No, recognizing that I had made all these plans for myself and I didn't, I never asked him once. Yeah. <laughs> I never once mm -hmm. asked him if it, if it showed up in a prayer, it was along the lines of, will you grant me this? Yeah. What my heart's desire. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was part of it. But also too, I think like, you know, in terms of recovery, um, my tendency, as I've mentioned is uh, to withdraw and to push God away. And so repenting, you know, like of, of, you know, shutting him out. Sure. When I, you know, when I then repent to say, I have been trying to do this on my own, I've been pushing you away is when I do make strides in, yeah. in recovery from any particular, you know, episode, I guess yeah. call it. Yeah. And it just, I mean, and there is something to be said too. I mean, just thinking about like the physical component, um, that your that your um your brain uh does respond to environment. In other words, um when you're not feeling safe, yeah, you're putting yourself, your brain in kind of an unstable position where you are um, you know, like there's a lot of energy being drained from you because you don't feel safe. You don't feel like things are okay. 
in repentance and in in reuniting with uh, that's not the right word um you know reconciling with god yeah. is maybe the word i'm looking for yeah. reconciling with god is acknowledging that i'm safe in you mm-hmm. yeah and that does feedback to your brain it yeah. really does Absolutely. so i mean that's yeah <laughs> it's not medication but there's something yeah. chemical going on it's there. it's interesting you mentioned this mm-hmm. that's one thing i wanted to touch on too that uh even when we talk about things like brain chemistry is a pretty abstract term i remember mm-hmm. also realizing again in my study of ocd i found that um you know does your brain chemistry drive the ocd or does uh your thought patterns drive your brain chemistry mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so through <laughs> yeah and so like behavioral or thinking therapy you're able to change your brain scans and like what areas of your brain are heating up and which chemicals are being released just by thinking differently. So uh, I think that for a Christian, that's very empowering. Like, wait a second, if I just continue to drill down some of God's promises into my mind, Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean all my problems inherently go away, but it means that if to the degree I believe those things, my brain can probably become even healthier uh, and that can drive my self perception, and that can drive my behaviors, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. There really is rest in believing. His yes. Promises. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Rest. Is there, if you were to summarize for somebody at home, um, you know, one thing along the way in your years of kind of self discovery on these mm-hmm. issues that has been helpful, or that you would encourage? Like, I always think if you could go back in a time machine to yourself 10, 15, 20 years ago, and somebody else is probably walking a similar path right now. What is one thing that you'd share that's been really helpful for you along the way? Reach out to somebody. Yeah. Um, I met Hannah mm-hmm. because um, I was struggling and my husband, then boyfriend, mm-hmm. uh, he, I mean, you know, you can only can only like listen to somebody so much but you can't empathize with them if right. you don't know what they're going through yep and that's when he said hey i want you to talk to someone <laughs> yeah and then we met yeah. and i just i think when i look back at the struggles that i've had that being in community yeah. um you know like when i when i was in bed not able to get out of bed and not going to church uh you know that didn't help <laughs> yeah. obviously yeah but i think the 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 hardest um thing for maybe like pride in mental health is mm-hmm. that like it's a it's an invisible illness yeah. and so people can't see it so if you are walking around or if you're wondering like why how come no one's reaching out to me like they they can't see yes. that you're not yep. feeling good so, so if mm-hmm. I just think that that's where as angry as, you know, some people might get to hear that, like, you got to reach out. Um, and that's where it's helped me is when I've mm-hmm. I've put my pride aside and I've said, OK, I, I can't do this alone. I need help. I'm really struggling. My thoughts are going like crazy. I just need to sit and talk to someone who's been through something or I just need to go to counseling yep. or I need someone to drag me to church yep. and be in community and um, just trying to set your pride aside and and being where two or more are gathered in yeah. his name. Mm-hmm. You know, I that's, that's my number one thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, having safe space where you can present all of your deepest fears and deepest struggles and weaknesses to somebody else from a, like a fellow Christian, it, they're also a sinner saved by grace. So they have no reason to ever judge you. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, yeah, I can just share all of that stuff and verbalizing it gives you some level of power over it, I think. Mm-hmm. So I, I love yeah. the idea of, uh, yeah, a friend who somebody has got to be able to like encourage you to get out of bed in life and and you probably yeah. want to be the one that encourages somebody else to get out of bed mm-hmm. right now too mm-hmm. so also just um accepting the grace that god has given you mm-hmm. yeah because i think sometimes we we really can get so in our heads um almost to the point where we are rejecting God's love for us and his grace. And we are like, it's okay to be angry at him and like shake our fists. But if we're saying, God, like 
it's your fault that you're doing this. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, that's where we're, we have tunnel vision and yeah. we're not seeing the full scope mm-hmm. of his love. And so I think I, I think that as annoying as it may be, if, if you have friends and family that are, that are inviting you to church and quoting scripture, you know, I, I didn't like it when Jack always was like, come on, let's go to church. My husband, (laughs) when he was like, let's go to church. And every week I'd be like, no, no. But someone was asking it to me every single week. Yeah. You know, when, when you're exposing somebody to the word, when you're exposing somebody to God, um, like eventually, uh, something, something will happen there. And so Mm -hmm. I just think trying to be open-minded and, and not, like I just remember getting so angry um, when one of my friends just kept bringing up like just kept bringing up God or like throwing Bible verses at me and like yeah. although it's not always helpful in the moment yeah. that's what I look back on yeah. and I go that's mm-hmm. that's a friend right there yeah. that's a friend right that's a Ruth right there yeah, yeah. you know yeah yeah great. yeah I totally agree that like yeah it is really easy when you're in the throes of it and I've mentioned this several times that I, I tend to get really really withdrawn mm-hmm. um and so like I don't I don't want to be around people and so yeah. like going to tr- yeah there was a period of time where I was just like oh, I can't go anywhere definitely not church yeah <laughs> this yeah. is the last place I want to be yeah um but recognizing that that is part of depression is to tell you that you're alone and nobody knows mm-hmm. what you're going through and nobody mm-hmm. cares anyway mm-hmm. and all those thoughts that spiral and spiral and spiral and even if so being around it. people he, oh he does <laughs> oh he is yeah. so winning when that happens mm-hmm. yeah um but so even if it's hard to be around people like my increase in understanding the Bible, not just knowing it from a good Christian standpoint, but understanding the Bible. Yeah. And I know this sounds really cheesy, but you've kind of got an, a set of friends yeah. in here. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, like yeah, there's a passage in Hebrews that says, um, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Yeah. And the witnesses in this book are living lives that are that do not look like they're succeeding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are people who have gone through this that are less than victorious. Mm-hmm. And this is the story God chose to tell us. These are the stories of people. You know what I mean? This isn't like, share your victories and let's all have a party. This yeah. is like, this is what life on earth looks like. So I think sometimes I start to feel really, really ashamed about my failures. And I think I'm not doing this right. Yeah. This has to be wrong. I just got to get a do over. I don't know. I got to do this over. And that's like, but that's not the story that God tells us about people. Yeah. This yep. this book is full of just failure after failure, but also mercy after mercy after mercy and yeah. pointing us to the time and place this is all over. So, yeah. you know, what is the point of us being here? Yeah. You know, like look to these friends too. Yeah. Um, to to understand. Yeah. What what what's the meaning of this? And it's to to love and be loved and to understand mercy, not just cognitively, but emotionally too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think yeah, the cloud of witnesses concept is mm-hmm. is great. And um even I always think the heroes of faith. You mentioned Hebrews, oh, Hebrews yes. eleven. Heroes of faith. Mm-hmm. They're not. They're not just heroes, and they're not heroes of faithfulness. They're heroes mm-hmm. of faith. In other words, they were massively weak, and they all failed in many different ways, yeah. from murderers to uh, adulterers to whatever. But oh, yes. they trusted. They rested in the righteousness of Christ. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, the only thing perfect in my life is my Savior. And I can accept that. I can accept myself mm-hmm. if I have that, you know, yeah. and like, that's enough. And it, there's a level of acceptance of, yeah, all my other weaknesses, all my other fears. And, and um, you know, I, I think too that, at least for me personally, when I tend to get the most anxious is when I feel like I'm giving a lot of energy. I think of energy like a finite resource. And I, I think it's part of the, part of the reason God gives us a like, like programs the Sabbath concept mm-hmm. is to say like, yeah, you're not. You're not God. You're you're a dependent, <laughs> finite creature. You're bound by time and space and energy. And when we start giving away too much energy to protect, usually our anxiety anxiety is trying to protect something in life that 
we maybe value even too much, mm -hmm. you know, sure. like the way people perceive us or whatever, but we give so much energy to that. You don't have enough energy to do what God actually calls you to do in your role as a wife or a mom or a dad or uh, a friend or whatever. And so I think understanding, thinking about like, if you had a budget of energy and like God said, yep, I give you this much energy and I want you to spend it to like build the kingdom, whatever that means in your own mm -hmm. personal uh, walk. I think uh, just saying, I can't give away so much care and concern to the things of life that are fleeting and don't matter too much has been for me, you know, a comforting thing. It's okay to not care so much about everything because, yeah. because I run out of energy, mm -hmm. but I want to thank you ladies for being with us uh, today and um, being a resource mm -hmm. and especially for our, our congregation and church community. I know that I don't think I'm overstepping by saying if somebody is struggling and maybe wanted to reach out and just have somebody who is a couple steps ahead of them on artic being able to articulate their uh, the overwhelm of their emotions, they can feel free to maybe reach out to me and I can maybe connect uh, mm -hmm. you guys. But I just want to thank you for your honesty, transparency, mm -hmm. and very clearly what the Lord is, is doing in you. And so if we can close with a prayer. Yeah. Heavenly Father, uh, I thank you for, number one, your presence with us here today. Um, your spirit uh, puts us at ease and reminds us of the hope that we have in you, in resurrection, in the life that is to come that really is life. And that gives us all the energy, fuel, and um, calm we need to face the storms of life in the present. Um, I'm thankful for these ladies here today and their honesty and very clearly the discipleship journey that you've led them on. Uh, where they've gained this self-awareness, uh, this confidence in you and your bigness and how that has led them to kind of calm the internal storms uh, so that they're they're stronger and more Christ-like. And I pray for everybody who's listening or watching today that they would find Christian community where they can openly share with people their struggles, their fears, their sins, their whatever, without fear of judgment. Um, but in, in doing so, find power, find grace, and uh, find loving brothers and sisters who will help them overcome those struggles. And Lord, in all of this, we find resurrection and it glorifies you. Uh, so thank you for your time with us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Thanks, ladies. Thank you. Thank you.